It's finally time, the finale to the three-part Weird World of Jimmy Neutron video series. Don't worry though, I still have two other fun Jimmy Neutron videos planned to come out this month. But for today, like the last two times, we're going to take a look at a season of Jimmy Neutron and just, just talk about all the fun weirdness within it. This time, it's the third and final season. We would have a fourth, maybe, but we got Planet Sheen instead. And yes, I made a video on that already. Also, last video I promised that I would get Hugh Neutron himself to make an appearance on the channel and without Without further ado, here he is. Well, hey there, Fringe. And hey, are those the viewers? Glad to have you stop by. Everyone here loves you and wants you in Nick All-Star Bra. Well, that is delighting. Say, I remember something about you not paying yet for my appearance on your channel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have your uh, your payment right here. I, I got uh, I got raspberry, uh, boysenberry, a pumpkin. Ooh, and mystery pie. Who do you think I am to accept some pie for payment? Because you'd be absolutely right. Bring on the pie. All right, sure. Take all of them. That's fine, I guess. My family will just starve. Yeah, well, see you in part four. Bye-bye now. But there is no season for... Ah, it doesn't matter. Welcome back, or hello, for the first time to the 25 Days of Fringemas, where I cover something interesting, nostalgic, or holiday-related every day from the 1st of December to the 25th in order to find that holiday spirit I lost nearly a decade ago. So if you want to be a part of this daily journey and help me find that good old jolly joy, subscribe and come board. Now, let me preface this for season three of Jimmy Neutron. It is unapologetically bananas, and it may not only feature a bunch of weirdness in general, but some of the funniest episodes in the entire series. So for our final part of the weird world of Jimmy Neutron, let's talk about it all. Yes, I mean all. Thanks to today's sponsor, Keeps. Their hair loss formula is amazing. They keep me with the hair on top of my head, and I love my hair. Personally, I don't want to lose it. Two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. With Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. Then, your treatment is shipped directly to your door every three months. You can message your Keeps doctor 24-7 with any questions or concerns you may have along the way, as well as track your progress with Keeps Progress Tracking Tool. Keeps is a more affordable option since Keeps offers generic versions of the FDA-approved medications for hair loss. Listen, prevention is key. Keeps treatments can take up to four to six months or more to start seeing results. So the faster you act, the better off you are in starting your journey. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Jordan Fringe or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Jordan Fringe. Thank you once again to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Right, so let's jump back into it because, well, because we got a lot to cover here. This is probably the longest video I've ever made for the channel, so I hope you enjoy. Also, based on things making sense episode to episode, a lot of season three seems out of order. Going as far back to the original releases being similarly out of order on TV to now how Paramount Plus has them listed. So to make things simple, we'll just go in the order in which Paramount Plus has them listed. Attack of the Twonkies. The season opener for Jimmy Neutron starts off with a bang. The double length special about little cute puffball things that Jimmy accidentally finds on a comet. He first runs into this monstrosity thing trying to destroy his ship. He narrowly escapes that, but Carl here is trying to find the perfect pet that doesn't trigger his allergies, and by extension, his dad's allergies. So when this little puff of sunshine comes around and it doesn't affect Carl in any way, he jacks it from Jimmy, no matter how uncomfortable Jimmy feels about him having this unknown alien thing. When showing it off in class for show and tell, it becomes a super popular thing amongst the students, and then it vomits out more brand new things that each student and Miss Fowl take as their own. But this newfound joy is quickly ended thanks to many different forms of music, from it being sung or played on a stereo, causing them to start turning pretty vicious, going from cute to still kind of cute, just deadlier. All these transformation scenes are all well hidden with cuts or objects so they can switch out the CGI assets or whatever the technical term would be. I don't make the cartoons, I just talk about them. You're welcome, society. Eventually, they all morph into the same looking one on the comet, with the only way to take them out is by having Sheen's awful singing voice put them to sleep. Sheen, this whole episode, thinks that he has this amazing voice and is mad that everyone doesn't want to hear him sing, but he ultimately saves the day. This special actually is really good and a fun way to spark the third season. It brought laughs, it brought action, it brought flippy, 
who gets d destroyed. Let's just hope that dummy doesn't come back in any way, shape, or form in a future episode. I mean that with sincerity and no foreshadowing in any way. At the end, Sheen's Twonky was overlooked and left on Earth, who is now shown regurgitating more of them for them to run rampant again one day. The cycle of life continues. It's so beautiful. Jimmy will be back. He messed up his hair and needs to add 11 pounds of moose. This guy has huge hair. Jimmy's back. Uh, try to contain yourself. Last time we got complaints from your neighbor. The End Men. Traveling in space in the car they won on Win Lose Kaboom from the end of the last season, the gang fly through a radiation belt messing up the ship's controls. When they crash land, they quickly realize that they have some sort of superpowers now from the radiation belt. Sheen can run really fast. Carl can burp really powerfully. Cindy is strong and can fly. Libby can turn invisible and Jimmy... Well, he's orange, but later turns into the Jolk. Get it? It's like the Hulk, but with a J for Jimmy. I know, I'm good at naming things, thank you very much. He's finally able to transform into Jolk after being made fun of too much by the others and getting into a verbal argument with Cindy. Even the government didn't want to take him when they captured all the rest of them. When trying to work on a cure to save them from all the powers, which are actually a detriment to them, he spills some purple flurp on his keyboard, causing him to have a full transformation into the Jolk. But before all that, they form a superhero group that's a mix of the Justice League and the Avengers in name. The Fantastic League of Justice bringing Avenging Men! Well, it actually quickly gets turned into the End Men, hence the title of the episode. And it also plays with DC and Marvel by having a mix of powers from all those different superheroes as well. Their costumes are basically just slightly different ripoffs of other well known superheroes, and Carl is just fabulous. They try to do the superhero thing and help around town, but since they aren't well organized, you know, like a good superhero team, they mess more things up than they do good. Leading to the government actually capturing them, like I said before, and after some inspiration from the Hulk 2003 film, they just have the rest of the team go after the Jolk to calm him down after he goes on a rampage. It's a fun parody of the superhero genre that is even funnier today than it would have been with now what seems only a few superhero film properties gaining popularity at that time. As the big fight is coming to an end, everyone starts feeling weak and collapses over. In a last ditch effort, Cindy admits her admiration for Jimmy and apologizes for always being mean and says that she actually does love him. Jimmy puts together a formula that saves them from their powers as they lose them, but Jimmy always has an ace up his sleeve for later. You know what's funny? I really told this episode out of order, much like how these episodes are out of order. Either I'm playing 4D chess here, or I'm just not smart. I'll let you decide. Lights, camera, danger. You like movies? I like movies. But what about being in the movies? Well, when a contest comes to town to send in a script for a contest where it can be made into an actual film, everyone thinks that theirs is going to be great and win. And they all clown on Nerdtron that he has no chance. Until the Big Shot movie director Quentin Smithy comes to say that Jimmy's script was chosen and that him and his friends are going to be the stars of it. Also, it will be filmed in Retroville. That's a lot of money saved on shooting on location. This episode is great. It's nonsensical, as I'll continue on in a minute, but it has a fun, silly premise. It also has the famous croissant Carl meme, and even Donut Boy. Donut Boy! That's me. We don't deserve Hugh's greatness. So after shooting on a rooftop where all the hooks fall off from their Matrix parody and they almost all die, and then when filming a romantic roller coaster scene that goes wrong almost killing them as well, we get the reveal that, uh-oh, it's Professor Finbar Calamitous. Who saw that one coming? Me. I did, I'm who. Later, after the random musical number, their top hats come to life with blades on them trying to once again slaughter them. G Jeez, Finbar, they're children. Jimmy puts a bunch of clues together based on Finbar never being able to actually finish anything and realizes it is Finbar during a Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets parody along with a giant serpent. But who else to save everyone but Donut Boy? So more points to Hugh. Also, there's this moment when Jimmy is watching all the most successful movies to come up with inspiration for his script. And when hearing all these classic film lines, we hear a line from the Jimmy Neutron film itself as he breaks the fourth wall by looking at the camera, lifting up his eyebrows. That's just such a brilliant joke. Well, let's move on, because as they say in the biz, Time is the money! Jimmy Neutron will be right back. And if that isn't enough, it's going to start off right where it left off. When will Jimmy Neutron be back? Good question. Fundemonium. Carl is the Tofunator and kills Sheen. Oh no, Sheen, now you can never make Planet Sheen. This is awful, I'm so sad. But after playing around for a bit, the news gets broken to Jimmy that they are moving based on Hugh's job moving as well. Like Max Keeble's big move, except less Magoogles. It's time to play a game of it's your favorite time for. His car sales job is useless in town since everyone has a car in town already. So in an effort for them to stay in Retroville instead of moving to Derryville, Jimmy convinces his dad to try and get a new job as a toy inventor. When he clearly isn't a, 
the best at it? Jimmy fixes up Hugh's toy idea and pretends that Hugh made it. But here comes the big reveal. The nanobots are back after their deleting escapades from the last season. Still wanting to impress him and be given another chance, they help him find some batteries, but Jimmy was too smart this time to trust them again, finally putting that big brain to work. Later, Hugh goes in for the interview, none the wiser about the look of his toy. It's a shiny ducky now! But the toy fully destroys their office where Hugh reads the room and leaves. When Jimmy notices his dad comes back with a moving van, he thinks like we do as if things didn't go well. But he actually got the job and needs to create a toy every day. He was only just just getting a ride from a guy who's driving a moving truck. So now, similar to how Jimmy put baby quackers together, he needs to now every day take the toy being worked on and turn it into something cooler that the company would want. This all catches up to him when he is exhausted, so in his tired state, accidentally lets his dad into the lab to grab the toy, and Hugh also takes the nanobots, thinking they're batteries. As if we all thought that these two were not somehow gonna do something pretty crazy this episode. And oh, it's a big one. This tank toy transforms in size, turning from a toy tank to a full-size tank that bursts out into the streets of Retroville, destroying the town and attacking citizens with licorice, gumballs, and candy canes. Actually, you know what? That sounds, pre that sounds pretty awesome, actually. Jimmy finally comes to and notices the toy and the nanobots are gone while an emergency alert plays. So Jimmy then uses his remote control from Baby Quackers to work with the toy tank, and the only way to stop it was to make it... uh... pee? Then it malfunctions and shrinks back in size. Surprisingly, the toy company loved it and the publicity it got, but Hugh didn't take the job since everyone's cars were destroyed and they'll now need new ones. Sure, that's how car shoppers and car owners operate, but it's cool. Fun episode, nanobots rock, stranded. Okay, this episode was actually pretty significant back in the day during the whole will they, won't they with Jimmy and Cindy, and it sets the course for them as characters for the rest of the show. We actually start the episode with them fighting about the equator being visible or not, so to prove one of them right and the other wrong, they all leave with minimal fuel in the hovercraft to go see. After more arguing, Jimmy and Sydney both fall into the water and the others can't stop because of the autopilot. There's an off button right there. Stupidness aside, nope, wait, more stupidness. Sheen rips out the mechanics, causing it to fall apart and freak out. Eventually then finding the off button right before they lose fuel and land in the water, stranding them there as well. Jimmy and Cindy, however, make their way to an uncharted island as they still fight and argue, but they quickly put their differences aside to survive on the island if they wanted any chance at that. Also also, Carl and Sheen might eat each other adrift at sea, especially after Carl can't even share his chocolate. But that's our Carl and we love him for it. Things on the island are going well, surprisingly. Jimmy and Cindy end up getting pretty close and more comfortable with each other, discussing their differences and why they always fight in the first place. They both admit to really liking each other, something that we have seen spark throughout the whole series, but season three ramps everything up and this episode really cements what we see going forward, as you can tell. Libby, Carl, and Sheen see a cruise ship go by that they try to get their attention to save them, but end up shooting them down blowing up the ship. They're okay though. We're okay! See, I told you. The network probably forced that line in there so we didn't just witness, you know, what we thought we just witnessed. Jimmy and Sydney find solace being together on a deserted island, enjoying what they can from the situation, in fact, becoming comfortable with it. But the rest of the gang actually finds the island where they're stranded at and they start working on fixing the hover car. Sydney confesses to Libby her feelings towards Jimmy after she suspects something's up, right before a giant spider attacks the ship looking for the eggs they mistook as rocks. Classic mistake. <laughs> Cindy makes a plea for her and Jimmy to stay on the island, but they end up deciding to go back and find an excuse while fighting to go back out on an adventure again. Ah, love. It leads to bad decisions. Jimmy goes to college. Listen, Jimmy, he do be smart. Too smart for his class. Nay, the rest of his school years to come. So Dean Kane visits Jimmy's house to invite Jimmy to attend this prestigious advanced physics college, and he excitingly accepts the invitation. Jimmy makes an entrance that he thinks will impress everyone, but everyone there is already smart and apparently has jetpacks. The other super smart guy in the class, Seymour, doesn't like being upstaged, so he sabotages Jimmy to make him look bad to the Dean and to the rest of the class. I just like that the Dean calls him James here since he's with the grown-ups now. And speaking of the grown-ups, all the grown-ups pick on Jimmy. Like, yeah, he's being a little bit of a doofus, but he's, he's still a kid, and you're all adults. Anywho, Hugh keeps killing pet fleas. Things are going well at home, it seems. Jimmy's college experience isn't turning out so great. Seymour continues to find ways to make his life miserable there. Also, he may just be the worst character in the show, and I mean that in so many different ways. He even leads a frat hazing upon Jimmy. It gets very weird in context here. I don't even want to go into it, but what the heck? All of this, no. 
Absolutely not. But all of what just happened leads to Jimmy being expelled. But before he leaves, he notices that Seymour earlier stole some important scientific notes, so now it's time for Jimmy to get his revenge. So Jimmy tries messing with the machine that Seymour stole notes for to build, but Seymour completely embarrasses himself on his own in front of the Dean and the Grant Gifter. Jimmy ends up saving the day here and earns the Grant from the Grant Gifter, and Seymour gets expelled. Good. I hate, I hate him. Even though Jimmy got the grant, he turns down going to college. At least right now in his life, and we'll get there when he gets there. This episode had me in the first half, uh, quickly lost me in the second. The Tomorrow Boys. It's Libby's birthday, but before going over to her place to celebrate, Jimmy builds a portal to 15 years into the future. And if it's 2005, that would make it one. And to, uh, 2020. Oh God, Jimmy, no, Jimmy, trust me, D uh, don't. Anyway, they look at their future selves. Sheen is a top model. All right, then Carl is a very chill llama breeder and looks pretty rad. Jimmy, of course, is winning nonstop Nobel prizes. But if Spider-Man taught us anything, the multiverse is real, then maybe this future won't be exactly how their specific future turns out. When they head out, Carl and Sheen get attacked by some killer daisies in Jimmy's lab, making Carl switch up Jimmy's gift with another mysterious spray. So instead of staying for the party, they all just want to go travel to the future, ditching the party and doing so. Ah, see, now this future looks a bit more accurate. Noticing a few extreme differences from earlier when they look through the portal, a four-armed robot cop tries to take them in, showing that the future Libby is now the dictator of Retroville. And I can also see where Thor Ragnarok got their inspiration for Hela. It's okay though, they all escape the slowest robots ever and make a break for Jimmy's lab in the future. We also find out that Carl switched the gif with Megalomanium, which, uh, doesn't sound great and an easy out for an explanation. When we meet older Jimmy, he's shown to be a slacker who lives in the lab, lost a lot of his smarts and is now married to the future Cindy. Then there's this joke about Jimmy screaming for four minutes straight when he finds out he married Cindy, right where the commercial break would be. Oh, I, I would do that joke with an ad now, but, but I'm better than that. Okay, no I'm not. So we see future Sheen is a dumpster diver and Carl is a wanted criminal. I dig it. Okay, seeing old Goddard here though did make me a bit sad, but they all team up together to figure out one, how to get back to the past, and two, how to prevent this future from happening. Which works pretty easy for them to escape back to the past with the robot police also bursting in and going through the portal as well. Firstly, murdering a daisy. As they all look for the megalomanium spray, they tear open all the presents at Libby's party, causing Libby to get really mad and throw them out. Where the robot is outside, ready to face off against them until his favorite classic band starts playing at the party, and he busts out a move so great young MC would be proud. Two people will know that reference. Max Keeble fans will know that reference. So while distracted, the boys get away to go destroy the rest of the gifts only to right before the robot comes back, find the actual gift and have the robot destroy it himself. Effectively saving the future from becoming a reality. Libby was still mad for everything being destroyed though, but gets over it once everything is explained. Even throwing some love Sheen's way. The League of Villains. But before I start, can I just say that they spelled villains wrong on Paramount Plus? Anyway, this episode's pretty epic. If you like all the villains from the show's history, this is the episode for you to watch. Serving as another double length episode where we see the return of the Yokian King Gubot from the original film, acting as the group's leader with the rest of the villains consisting of Beautiful Gorgeous, Professor Finbar Calamitous, Baby Eddie, Junkman, Grandma Taters, the Space Bandits, and Eustace Stritch. A nice rogues gallery of fun characters that all want to take down Jimmy Neutron, or each other, but mostly Jimmy. Jimmy though built a wormhole generator that will be a plot point later on, but it is revealed that there were some secret test tubes of powers that he had from the Endmen episode, which will let them have their powers again for 30 minutes. Hmm, more foreshadowing? Hey, could be. All the villains split up into teams to take down all of Jimmy's friends, Goddard, and sealing the lab from Jimmy getting access to it. The Yokian chicken ship swoops down to kidnap Jimmy with Sheen hanging on the bottom of the ship. They put him on trial for his crimes against criminals, and it's pretty biased to say the least, and he's found guilty. Oh nice, Sheen came to help Jimmy, but it, it really didn't help. Now they're both trapped in the cell together, and T from the space bandits hasn't been having a good time with all the other villains consistently poking fun at him and he's pretty much over it all. So when Sheen just asks a general friendly question, he begins to question what he's doing, working with, and being a bad guy. Jimmy sends a message to Carl's computer mid partial love letter to Jimmy's man to have help come after them. T though actually ends up helping them escape after Sheen and T become legit friends. There's this whole theme throughout the episode about people never changing, but as long as you share your last piece of gum with them, things can really change. Before the gang all head out to save Jimmy, Carl grabs the Endmen serums, but 
drops Jimmy's and takes the love potion that was right next to them instead. So Carl, Cindy, and Libby all blast off and let Jimmy's parents know what's happening. But the parents want to help too, so they end up going into Jimmy's lab to look for a way to help. Instead, they accidentally turn on the wormhole generator. See, I told you it would come back. Retroville starts slowly being sent back in time 75 million years. Hey, that seems pretty stressful. T, Jimmy, and Sheen escape from the ship, but the rest of the gang arrive at the same time. But the other villains blast their ship out of the sky and have them careening towards the closest planet. So of course, Jimmy, T, and Sheen all head after them and they all end up on the planet alive. And the villains join them there as well. When Carl presents the Endman serum, they tell the bad guys that, oh, it's bad and we totally shouldn't drink this, it'll make us go mad. So the bad guys have them drink the serum. But Jimmy notices that his isn't there, and everyone takes the wrong one, giving each other each other's powers. Which is actually a fun concept to actually bring the powers back instead of just having them be like they used to be, and not being used for some easy cliche scapegoat. The villains think that it's just all them going mad and they're enjoying it, but it's taking too long so it's time to kill them, as villains always like to threaten. Cindy, about to confess her love again to Neutron, reminds Jimmy about the love potion which he uses on the junk man and beautiful gorgeous as they just start going at it. I did not need to see this on this fine December evening, or any evening for that matter. But here we all are at the same time, isn't that weird? While all the villains are now distracted, they sneak off to a ship and get off the planet. Oh, hey, Brobot's still on the moon, but you know what, let's just leave him there. Jimmy's such a good big brother. The space chase now heads back towards Earth, where Jimmy sees the wormhole generator has gone off causing a new problem for them, or a great solution. Now in the past, they use the, wait, C Carl, stop. They use the power of dinosaurs to defend, distract, and detain, as Jimmy does his science thing to save everyone and reverse the wormhole generator bringing Retroville back into the correct time period. T uses his newfound goodness to convince the other two space bandits, Zix and Traveltron, to help out and not be bad. The rest of the villains get trapped in the past thanks to Jimmy sticking them in a force field while they all travel back. So yeah, the villains are stuck 75 million years in the past now dealing with T-Rexes and dirty diapers for a long, long time. Also, Jimmy has way too many photos of Betty Quinlan, Creep. Clash of Cousins, Who's Your Mommy? Now, as far as the whole Who's Your Mommy episode, we've covered that extensively here on the channel. A full video on it, actually, so go check that out. It deals with Carl being pregnant with an alien baby. Yes, it's as weird as it sounds. It would be redundant to re-go over it all. This video is already going to be super long, but that is for sure the weirdest episode overall, so enjoy that, or not. For Clash of the Cousins, the extended Neutron family, who mostly just look like Hugh, will all come to celebrate great Aunt Amanda's birthday, with Jimmy trying to impress her as she doesn't like him, his present to her immediately goes awry and the spatula explodes. Somewhere, Spongebob is crying. This does not help Jimmy's case with not being liked. Also, all the palm pilots he gave everyone, nah, they explode as well. He gets set inside away from the party as punishment, but Jimmy uses this time to figure out what happened to his gifts, and deduces that another genius, this time evil, is in the family and at the party doing this. It turns out that it's Baby Eddie, who just pretended to be an average baby, blending in with everyone. He actually wanted Aunt Amanda to die for her money. Now that baby seems like a real boss. They should make two movies and a Netflix show with that idea. Jimmy saves them all once more after Eddie rigged the birthday cake and just starts fighting the baby. Everyone is freaking out on Jimmy and no one believes him until he proves it with rigging his rattle to explode, causing Eddie to freak out and speak. Now everyone loves Jimmy. Yay. Weird episode to tag along to an already weird episode. My Big Fat Spy Wedding. This episode brings back the Jet Fusion storyline, where the BTSO call on Jimmy Neutron for help trailing Beautiful Gorgeous, who got out of her 45 year jail sentence two weeks into it for good behavior. Yeah, okay. The gang tag along. Carl wants to make it a spy musical, but run into Beautiful Gorgeous and Jet Fusion shopping together as they reveal that, well, they're getting married. Jimmy gets asked to be his best man at the wedding, but Jimmy doesn't buy any of this. Something has to be up. While following them around and spying on the spies, they keep mistaking things as her trying to take him out. And after so many mistakes, they just end up believing it's true. But as soon as they give up and leave, we see Beautiful Gorgeous hypnotize Jet Fusion to destroy the next person who says, I have the ring, which would be Jimmy. Or will it? Sheen accidentally said I have the ring, causing Jet to try and destroy Sheen until Goddard knocks him out of the trance he fell into. Jimmy senses something's up, well you think? And takes off to go and find Beautiful Gorgeous, gets trapped in a cage once they engage in a fight. Guess there's more than one engagement in this episode. Oh, that's so stupid. I hate that I tried to make that joke. Anyway, she hypnotizes him to forget any of that just happened and shoots him out of the house. But Sheen and Carl heard everything and try to take her down as well, only to end up in the same fate within a cage, but this time they keep their memory. Now, as the wedding is about to start, Cindy 
Cindy starts thirsting over Jimmy in a tuxedo, like really, really thirsting. But Sheen and Carl escape thanks to Sheen's monkey speaking abilities. But other monkey business must be attended to, so the wedding gets interrupted before Jimmy can say I have the ring, causing Carl and Sheen to say it, turning Jet Fusion into a killing machine once again. So then everyone starts saying it to confuse Jet, this shot is terrifying. Everyone breaks out into song about having the ring, and Jet snaps out of the trance. Seems logical. Beautiful Gorgeous was stopped, they all get honorary spy medals, and Jet Fusion becomes a simp. Jimmy Neutron will be right back on Friday Night Nicktoon. Now back to the adventures of Jimmy Neutron, boy genius, on Friday Night Nicktoon. Crouching Jimmy Hidden Sheen. Here we start off with Yu Yi, a kung fu warrior who wants to be known as the Chosen One. Not Sheen, who is currently the Chosen One because, well, he can put his leg behind his head. Back in Season 2 during the special Operation Jet Fusion episode, he was given the title of Chosen One, a fun little callback to that story thread. So Yu Yi tries capturing Sheen, but when that doesn't work, he sets up a plan to capture Libby. This sparks Sheen, for the love and life of Libby, to head to Shangri-Lama to fight him in a kung fu battle. Jimmy first helps him easily do some kung fu with his dance learning device thing, Look, I'm not a genius here with all the technical terms. I'm just chilling. So funny story about those kung fu moves. Well, they wore off and Jimmy's machine gets broken. So this fight should go swell. But before the fight, Sheen seeks Master Hong to teach him as much kung fu as possible before the fight. After our standard training montage, Sheen faces off against Yu Yi to the best of his abilities. It's mainly him just getting his butt kicked for the majority of the fight until Libby gives Jimmy a ruby that was on her head to help fix the dance kung fu machine. And once Libby says she's his girlfriend, he gets the Eye of the Tiger, using the dance moves to absolutely wipe the floor with him. And then Cindy comes out of nowhere and finishes him off. Rude way to take his victory from him, that's just not courteous. The episode ends pretty weird with a bunch of fake bloopers and I wish that this happened all the time because it was great. The Incredible Shrinking Town. If you want to see Jimmy at his most unhinged yet, you get it here. After spending too much of his daily life being made fun of or made to feel bad about his height, Jimmy, before absolutely destroying this whole man's career, gets his remote knocked out of his hand and destroyed by the hammer strength game, causing it while on the human shrieking setting to make every human in Retroville tiny. At the same time, the trio of alien space bandits, Zix, Traveltron, and T, come to Earth to lay low from space law. You don't mess with space law. But find instead an opportunity to capture all the little humans now running around and, oh my, that, that person is just dead now. Jimmy and the gang outsmart them, reverse everything, shrink the aliens, but the fact that Sheen puts his love for Ultra Lord aside to be with Ultra Lord's fiance just means our little Sheen is growing up. I can't wait to see what's next for him. Oh. Yeah, never mind. We go, go watch that video if you want or not. I don't care. One of Us Vanishing Act. Starting off with Jimmy and Cindy on the run from everyone, we cut back to earlier at school when Cindy is away at a karate tournament and Sheen's patient zero for watching the Happy Show Show and seems more completely brainwashed than he would be watching Ultra Lord. Jimmy the next day noticed how weird and happy everyone is. And after Betty Quinlan convinces him to finally watch it, we see Grandma Taters, who is the host of Happy Show Show and Jimmy it just hates it and turns it off. Doesn't even watch. Letterbox one star. Jimmy notices that it's actually hypnotizing everyone to be under Tater's control as the broadcast will start going worldwide soon. Everyone aside from himself and Sydney, who comes back to town just in time to be chased by everyone, are now on a mission to track down Grandma Taters and the source of the broadcast. Jimmy and Sydney find the retirement home where she resides and Jimmy bursts down the door to confront her. But she expected this and laid a trap to capture him, clockwork oranging him to be hypnotized by the show. But hope is not lost because Sydney comes in just just in time and wrecks everyone a new animation style, pulling an Uno reverse card capturing her and running a broadcast of his own to bring everyone back. But she must go back home now after her plans were foiled, being revealed to be of an alien race of grandmas. Fantastic. The other part of the episode follows Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen purchasing a magic kit of the great Spamdini, but he's only doing the magic stuff for Betty Quinlan's love. When actually performing at the school and Cindy getting jealous, messing with all the knobs on Jimmy's device, something goes amiss and they all get sent through a portal that goes past the twilight zone and into a realm where everyone besides Jimmy is only a floating head. All except for Libby, who is distracting the crowd back at the school to pay no attention. When finding their bodies, a mysterious arm Carl finds chases them until they all become their digital skins, minus the details. Again, I'm not a professional with CGI, so whatever this look is called, it's cool. They visit Twin Peaks, ultimately finding Spam Dini, who has been lost to time and space from a similar accident. Ooh, ooh, I've seen this. This is the Avengers moment when we're all supposed to clap because everyone else is clapping. I don't even know I'm making that joke. I, I really like Endgame. They find a portal home thanks to a tuna fish sandwich. That is the plot. Spamdini goes to Pastrami World again. That is the plot. And Sheen's head is on backwards. 
I mean, what else is new? An interesting pair of half episodes here that aren't as grand as most episodes in the season, but weird, yeah, that sure, that's a word I'll use. The Trouble with Clones. Jimmy's evil clone is back as a space battle sees Jimmy beating Jimmy, the good one beating the evil one. Evil Jimmy roasts Jimmy on him no longer inventing something new and relying on the same old tactics. A bold take on how the show found a way to spice things up in season three so far in a good way. The evil clone messes with the de-evilizer equipment and pretends to be the good Jimmy clone, styling himself to look exactly like him, and Jimmy just uh, lets him go? What? Like, you're supposed to be a genius, but you a whole idiot. Evil Jimmy stole Jimmy's hypnotized ray to make everyone in town bend to his will of doing random things. Not the most evil, but hey, it's a start. Also, Jimmy has cameras all around town in very personal spots, it seems, as well, so, uh, Maybe they're both evil. Evil Jimmy breaks into the lab when Jimmy's gone to steal a duplicator that still has some kinks to fix from it and escapes. A new planet appears in the sky, and I'm not talking about Super Mario Galaxy here. It's a clone of, get this, Earth. And after a bunch of maybe real or fake scientific jargon, uh, people are back to the future and with their bodies starting to fade away from the duplicator. On Earth number two in the sky, it's revealed that that whole planet is the evil version of everything, where everyone is awful and mean to one another. Jimmy, to blend in, goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puff again. That's for your mother and this is for you! <gasps> Jimmy, how dare you. Evil Carl beats up Jimmy. You're mine, shrimp dip. What? Jimmy beats up some girls, gets in trouble with the Board of Education. Fun times to be had by all, except for Jimmy. With one second left, Jimmy saves the real Earth from fading away as evil Jimmy sets off a Dark Matter chip, sending Earth 2 and everyone on it to the Dark Matter dimension. No, those are my poor condition Diffusion Wave Motion Yu-Gi-Oh cards. This isn't even a good cutaway joke. I'll be back! No, you won't. There's no season four. Up next, it's Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> on next. It's more Jimmy Neutron on next. The Evil Beneath Carl Weezer, boy genius. Heard of the Bermuda Triangle? Well, get ready for the Bahama Quadrangle. Jimmy doesn't believe all the rumors that are going down at the Bahama Quadrangle, so he takes Carl and Sheen directly there. And right on time, the fog sets in and the GPS is not working. Oh yeah, and the engine shut off. They then chew that gum that allows them to breathe and speak underwater to investigate the area, and they end up getting sucked into some sort of kelp processing plant where they run into one of Jimmy's scientific idols who has these green algae men work for him. And he doesn't want to return to the surface and share his work with the outside world, as they made fun of him and shunned him in the past. But how do we get these, uh, these algae men, huh? Is it A, capturing people passing by the area, tricking them into eating something that will transform them, B, forcing them to watch every video I've ever made, or C, subscribe to the Jordan Fringe YouTube channel? Oh, come on, it's never C. Yeah, they were tricked. They start turning into food mascots and must figure out a way to start turning back and escape, which is pretty easy to do, apparently. Not their grandest adventure, but it sure was a weird bit. Also, the fog may actually contain monsters, but we don't need to find out why. The next part, we see Carl exclaim that he has a Swedish pen pal girlfriend who's coming to visit. But uh-oh, it's the classic lie to seem like someone else to someone else to win them over. He basically has been pretending to be Jimmy, so after some convincing, Jimmy lets Carl pretend to be him. A concept we We've seen plenty of times before, but now with 100% more Carl. Oh yeah, Jimmy has to kind of play an idiot. Just like that Spongebob episode when Patrick's parents were coming to visit. So to look smart, Carl... <laughs> <laughs> looks like this. <laughs> looks more like an Elton John costume gone wrong than a boy genius, but hey, whatever floats your llama. You know where this goes. Carl power trips, Jimmy gets pissed off, and the truth comes out. Attila the Hun also comes out too at one point, where Carl actually saves the day with nuts. I can't believe that's a sentence I just said, but it's true. Nuts? Nuts? Nuts! Somehow everything works out that they both admit to lying to one another, and Carl, uh, ooh, I guess forgot about it. Jimmy's mom. Who framed Jimmy? Flippy. Never mind on the forgetting about Jimmy's mom part, this episode starts off with this. What do you guys want to do today? Hang out with your mom? The gang find out after a robbery that evidence found leads to Jimmy as the lead suspect. Jimmy willingly goes with the cops after reviewing footage of his lab to see who broke in, in which they found some leads on. Jimmy gets put in a cell and makes his allotted phone call to Sheen, of all people. Come on, boy genius, what are you doing? We're supposed to help you escape! <laughs> Well, that was messed up. Carl and Sheen get caught trying to help Jimmy break out, so now they're held in there with Jimmy. But they soon break away while they're in a chain gang outside working. They end up borrowing Banjo Playing Boy's wood-based processing unit to search those clues he found from his lab surveillance, but they quickly get caught up with by the law when they have Cindy help them put the rest of the pieces together. Turns out that Buford Storm Shuckle here was the real mastermind behind this for some reason. Why wasn't he in the League of Villains? This episode is weird for the fact it felt 
almost half complete. I don't know. This may be one of my least favorite segments of the season. The other part brings back Flippy. Well, Flippy 2 from earlier this season. And guess who's coming to school for a career day to show off their ventriloquism skills? Yup, good old Hubert. Jimmy does this. Your sombrero? She is ready. All right. Jimmy puts a chip in Flippy to help actually make with the funny since Hugh can be quite embarrassing. But the chip works a little too well. And it also does this. From now on, Flippy isn't leaving my side. Okay, I am terrified and very much wish to cut to commercial break. No, we can't do that right now. It would break the flow of the video up. Fine, I guess I'll wait. You better hit that like button. Yeah, so the chip makes Flippy the dominant vessel, turning Hugh into a husk as Flippy is bossing everyone around, threatening to hurt Hugh's brain if Jimmy does anything to stop him. So he does something, it's too late. The puppet becomes sentient and is trying to rid the body of Hugh from this world, but they trick him with ducks to distract him, hold him down and terminate the chip, bringing Hugh back. No more puppets, please. Oh, come on. Okay, now can we cut to an ad break? Don't move. Jimmy Neutron's up next, right here on Nicktoons. He's Jimmy Neutron, boy genius. And he's up next on Nickelodeon. Ah, all better. Oh, I thought we were finished. Got a few more episodes to go. At some point, this will be the length of a billion video. Love that guy. Anyway, how to sink a sub. Lady sings the news. Starting off with a bunch of school teachers trapped in hyperspace in a car, thanks to Jimmy who sent them there to give everyone a week free of teachers. But thanks to Carl being uh, Carl, all the parents find out and make the kids stop partying and fill in as substitute teachers. Jimmy's mom ends up teaching his class first, full on embarrassing Jimmy. We also have Carl's dad, Sheen's dad, Jimmy's dad, etc. And Jimmy creates a hormone concoction that the parents all accidentally take in their coffee, which makes them all become more rebellious and angsty than the kids themselves. In fact, much worse. Sheen's dad may be spending time with Carl's mom? But before too long, the teachers make it back just in time to fight the parents. They handle the situation, punish Jimmy, and the day is saved thanks to... Uh, I don't know, the Pythagorean theorem or something. The next part follows a Hollywood superstar executive who wants to put together a kid-based news show featuring the usual cast of characters. I mean, just look at their hairdos and outfits. I love it. And that's all the episode really is. Until Libby has her gossip section, spilling out all the rumors and dishes out the tea. Give it a little longer and Libby will be making videos on whatever Trisha Paytas is doing. The school begins to make fun of those who she embarrassed, while Libby is well-liked and people don't want to get on her bad side to be gossiped about on the news. So in order to stop this from happening, the rest of the gang play a prank on her where Carl is speaking to aliens about a plot to eat kittens, all while Libby spies in on this. So when she reports it, she loses her credibility, is what I would say if they all didn't downright believe her, so they all try to kill Carl first. Free my boy Weezer. But none of it matters, they let him go, the show gets cancelled, and... That's it. Oh, but Jimmy and Cindy, uh, well, I'm happy things are working out. King of Mars. Everyone's hanging out, staring up at the sky as Mars apparently is acting all weird. It seems a limitless power source is showing clear active signs on Mars' surface. Then we see the villain Eustace Stritch come to be Jimmy's antagonist in this episode, along with that little bit of War of the Worlds inspired imagery. We do see this continuation of Jimmy and Cindy's relationship as Jimmy is nervous about committing and being in the moment with her as she is trying her best for him. Now in a race against Eustace to Mars, they use that same car from Win Lose Kaboom Again, a nice cool callback. But some proton blasts hit them with Eustace at the cause of it. He wants to rule the planet and be the first king of Mars. Uh, how about no? After barely escaping some missiles, they just barely make it out of a crash landing. And I can barely speak anymore after speaking for this long. Seriously? I can't... <coughs> Where was I? After more awkward relationship fighting between Jimmy and Cindy, Stritch captures Cindy and tries to sway Cindy to his side. But her only goal is to make sure no one gets hurt and that Jimmy gets jealous. Oh, and, and Rich, she, she wants the money too. But after he goes and steals Jimmy's map, thanks to her help, he just dumps her out and leaves her to deal with the now more awkwardness. Jimmy then admits to Cindy that he does like her back and acts weird because he knows his crush on her distracts him from his scientific work. Also RIP my boy Goddard. Now it's a race to the power source with Carl Stretch Pan versus Stritch's rich boy stance. When both get to the power source first, a battle is about to begin until some golems who protect the power source explain that Mars is not a dead planet and that they are tired of Earth always sending probes and rovers and such to take a look. And now they're gonna kill us all. Jimmy and Eustace now having to work together while the others distract the golems end everything in a time crunch to stop them, but by accident, Eustace turns the skies to acid rain instead, which hurts the golems. They make a deal to leave with some power and they'll reverse the acid rain. 
rain. They all head back to Earth together. No one suffers any more consequences and the day was saved. Okay, we already made that joke next episode. Best in show, El Magnifico. We focus here on Sheen and his father learning to bond since their interests are very different. So Sheen's dad tells Sheen that he is El Magnifico, a superhero who is better than Ultra Lord. So the gang is very skeptical about that, especially Jimmy who ends up helping Sheen's father who begs him to help him look like a hero to his son. Especially after Sheen comes over with his father overhearing everything that Sheen's ready for disappointment from his father tomorrow when he's supposed to prove to him that he is a superhero. Jimmy puts together a suit that's a mixture of Ultra Lord and Iron Man that really works. In fact here, even if it was his own fault in the first place, he still just saved Carl. Okay, someone write the comic book and make the toy licensing and movie deals. So heading to the zoo, they go and set up a bunch of things to make it look like he's really being heroic. The first thing is a zebra peed scenario to save and impress Sheen. And look, things are going well, except for Bulby. But then real danger presents itself, sparking Sheen's dad to tell him the truth. And they have a touching moment as this alligator comes charging at them. The dad uses his real life work skills to save the day rather than his manufactured superpowers, earning the respect from his son and gives them the chance to fully bond. It's quite sweet actually, and I'd love a feel good vibey episode. The final part, best in show, is about owners and their pets being shown off competing for best in show. Even intergalactic villains can compete. Goddard wins, but all the others are upset because Goddard is a machine and not an animal. And in the rules, robot dogs are not considered pets, so Cindy wins. And Goddard took that personally. So he leaves a binary note for Jimmy and takes off. So now in the lay of the land, as Goddard is trying to find his way out in the world by himself, thinking that he is no good for Jimmy, he tries to bring joy to another kid. And after just trying to have some fun, the kid's mom calls over the police to take him as now Goddard is set to be destroyed. With Jimmy now out looking for Goddard, he spots Cindy who is now in danger because of her dog. So he calls out to Goddard to save her, and Goddard does so and gets awarded. It's not a new concept, but it's executed fine enough for how chaotic and fast this second half of the episode is. Like, look at this Fast and Furious pileup that's going on, jeez. And that's it. Season 3 of Jimmy Neutron. As I said at the beginning of this, as you can see as we went through the episodes in order of their listings, a lot feels out of order, especially for villain continuity, relationship continuity, and a whole bunch of other things that don't really relate to whatever follows next. But it's easy enough to suspend that disbelief to just enjoy it. Aside from those connective tissues, it's still a very standalone individual episode type of show, but only for the most part. I think a lot of the extra energy this season has also lies on the characters doing stuff in the background from continuing jokes, having something completely odd happen, something funny or random happening, and even just the little details that can easily be missed. Miss Fowl mocking students being a great example. In fact, she's on X Games mode this season against her students with sass, and I am here for it. It's always great to see a show continue to go in the right direction when it comes to the quality of how the show is made on all aspects, even if it's the final season against the show's volition. Also, seeing the Twonkies make cameos throughout the rest of the season in the background or foregrounds of shots in almost every episode is a nice little detail. Jimmy Neutron as a whole is weird, but in the best ways possible. The series to this day still looks good as the animation has held up pretty great in my opinion, and a fair bit of the jokes and punchlines are extremely well written, with a handful of them also being a bit dated and totally a product of their time. Other than that, the show really found itself with new energy here, and I'm so happy that season 3 ends the series off on a high note rather than feeling overdone, past its time, or this overall feeling of that people behind it not as caring as they may have in the past. It hits all the right notes that made Jimmy Neutron special in the first place. It amps up the characters the right amount as to not fully flanderize them, in which we see with Sheen and Planet Sheen. And by this season, the creators knew two things. Carl and Hugh are the fan favorite characters, and oh boy, do they shine this season. Carl is perfect with these quick quips and conversations while still maintaining his usual Carl mannerisms. Hugh is... Well, more hue, and we love that. Fringe? Oh no, that that wasn't a cue for you to come back. Take your pie and scram. See you in part four. There is no see. Well, actually, you may have noticed throughout my Weird World of Jimmy Neutron series that there was a distinct lack of a certain trilogy of crossover events. Yes, the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour trilogy. So I am here to say that don't worry, I am working on a video covering them that should be out in the next week or so. So look out for that. And maybe even another Jimmy Neutron video later in the month as well. I want to give a huge shout out to Uncle Al for lending his voice talent in today's video. His fantastic channel is linked down below. Go check it out. Let me know in the comments what part of season three is your favorite or what you think is the most weird. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. Follow me on Twitter or else I'll see you tomorrow with another video for my next day of Fringe Miss. Check out the playlist to keep up with the month, but until then, I'm tired. Later.